Yok. Thank you, Dr. Greer, for the introduction, and thank you, everybody, for coming to my talk today. I'm just going to talk about my progress on my project, the identification and characterization of fat kinase as a novel regulator of pdl one stability and activity in breast cancer. Sorry, this always just takes a second. There we go. Okay, so I just really wanted to quickly go over an overview on what I'll be talking about today. So first I'm gonna start with my background information. And then I'm going to talk about my hypothesis and specific aims, my results, my future directions, and then just a short summary and then the significance of my project. So just to start us off, I'll be going over some background information. As most of us know, breast cancer is the most common cancer among women, and during diagnosis, one in four cancers diagnosed in women are breast cancer. And also, 13% of deaths caused by cancer in Canadian women is breast cancer as well. So there are four types of breast cancer. For the purpose of my project, I'll be focusing on triple negative breast cancer, uh, as because as to date, triple negative breast cancer does not have an effective targeted therapy compared to all the other subtypes. So triple negative breast cancer makes up about 10 to 20% of breast cancer tumors, and they are ca categorized by its aggressive behavior, its triple negative phenotype, which is having no estrogen, hormone, or progesterone receptor. Um, and also it has a poorer prognosis compared to all other cancer sub uh, breast cancer subtypes. And then triple negative breast cancer is also very hard to treat as there are still, as there are very few targeted therapies that are approved by the FDA, but there are still a bunch that are in clinical trials right now. And then, so as of right now, conventional therapies such as chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery are what are the go-to current treatments. So there is a need to find a new targeted therapy. And as of right now, uh, researchers have been looking into new, uh, new targets such as program death ligand one. So program death ligand one, also known as PDL one, was first discovered in the 1990s to be a part of the B7 protein family. It binds to its receptor program death receptor one, and is a trans and a and is a type one transmembrane protein that inhibits immune responses. So when the ligand and receptor meets, um, it causes a down regulation of T cell immune responses, making it essential for central and peripheral immune tolerance. Due to this function, the PD one and PD one axis is known as an immune checkpoint. So despite this highly regulated process in our immune system, cancer has learned to take advantage of it. So preclinical studies have shown that the PD-1 and PD-L1 access could be a potential mechanism in which cancer uses to escape T-cell anti-tumor responses, as PD-L1 expression has been shown on a vast amount of cancer cells, particularly in solid tumors, such as colorectal cancer, lung cancer, and breast cancer. So many studies have shown that PDL1 expression has been found in half of in half of breast cancer tumors being correlated with a poor prognosis and having highest expression of PDL1 being found in tri uh, triple negative breast cancer here as well. So um, so due to this researchers then sought to discover a treatment that targeted these immune checkpoints instead. So in 2018, James P. Allison and Tosuku Hanjo's research led to their discovery of immune checkpoint inhibition. And in 2014, the very first immune checkpoint inhibitor, Pembrolizumab, was FDA approved. The goal of this immunotherapy was to uh, boost anti-tumor responses by stopping the PD-1, PD-L1 immune evasion, as seen here. When the uh, when the therapy of anti-PD-1 uh, anti or anti-PD-L1 is given to a patient, it blocks the receptors, um, blocking the interaction between the two. Therefore, there wouldn't be any uh, immune suppression. So as of right now, immune checkpoint inhibitors have been approved for, uh, for more than 25 types of cancer, one being the most prominent, seeing the best results, being melanoma. But unfortunately, there are limitations to this. Only... 
there are, there are very few cancers that have actually exceeded a response rate of 40%, and only a few patients have actually um, reached a complete response. As mentioned before, triple negative breast cancer has a very high expression of PDL1, but unfortunately, uh, its, rate, its response rates to immune checkpoint inhibitors remains low. Thus, there is a need to boost e efficacy of anti pdl one therapies. One promising avenue is post-translational modifications, such as phosphorylation, ubiquitination, or glycosylation, as they are integral in protein stability. So recent studies have shown that post-translational modifications are essential in pdl one expression, but also the PD-1, pdl one mediated immune evasion. Given the role that protein kinases have in the regulation of proteins, uh, investigations began to see if there were any protein kinases that actually directly modify PDL1. As of right now, there are a few that have been identified, such as GSK3 beta, AMPK, CK2, and JAK1. So, quickly seen here, um, when JAK1 is stimulated by IL6, it associates with an unglycosylated PDL1, which then causes phosphorylation at, its ty as, at a tyrosine site, and then allowing for glycosylation in the cytoplasm and eventually expression on the cell surface, which then subsequently interacts with PD-1 on the T cell and then causes immunosuppression. But when the JAK1 isn't stimulated by IL-6, there is no association with unglycosylated PD-L1, no phosphorylation, therefore it is eventually degraded and not expressed on the cell membrane. Therefore, uh, the T cell killing effect is enhanced. So to date, there are about 560 kinases identified in the human kinome, but there have been no systematic screening that's been done to identify kinases that regulate PDL1 stability and activity. So this makes me ask the following questions. What is the mechanism behind PDL1 upregulation in triple negative breast cancer? What's, what other kinases could have a role in PDL1 stability and activity? And then how can we identify other kinases that regulate PDL1? And then this leads me to my hypothesis and specific aims. So given the function of protein kinases, we hypothesize that novel kinases identified by a systematic screening may, may regulate breast cancer cell immune evasion through regulation of pd one stability. And so in order to test these hypotheses, this hypothesis, I have three different aims. The first one was to identify and validate kinases regulating pd one stability by a kinome-wide protein kinase inhibitor screen. The next one was characterizing FAC as a novel regulator of PDL1 stability in triple negative breast cancer cells, MDA, MB231, and BT549. And then finally, the interaction of FAC and PDL1 in immune evasion. So now I will just be discussing my results. So first, I'll be focusing on AIM1. And in this AIM, I had three sub AIMs. The first one was establishing a HEC293A cell line stably expressing PDL1 nanoluck doing a high throughput screening for protein kinase inhibitors regulating PDL1 stability. And then finally, just the validation of these primary hits by a Western blot analysis. So first I'll be just going over 1.1. So one of the postdocs in our lab, Dr. Pren Kanal, started this PDL1 project. So first he cloned the, um, the open reading frame of PDL1 into a PNLF vector to make a construct expre uh, expressing PDL1 nanoluck luciferase fusion protein. So the nanoluck tag at the C terminal it is to measure protein stability using luciferase activity. So if protein so if protein stability were to go down, so would luciferase activity. So afterwards, he transfected the plasmid into HEC293A cells and selected the cells expressing this plasmid with hygromycin. To verify that these cells were stably expressing PDL1 nanoluck, we did a he did a luciferase assay and Western blot to validate this expression. So here were the results of that. As we can see, there are three clones here, one, two, and three, all successfully um, expressing PDL1 nanoluck, but at different degrees. And this also just validates uh, that the nanoluck. A uh, tag helps us understand protein stability. As we can see in the Western blot, uh, for clone one protein, uh, there's very lo little protein, but also very little protein in the luciferase activity. So now that we have a cell line that stably expresses PDL1 nanoluck, we can move on to our next sub aim, which was conducting a high throughput screening for PKI regulating PDL1 stability. 
So since there was no systematic screening of protein kinases, initially that's where we decided to begin. So he, first I plated, or we plated this, uh, the HEC 293A cells in a 384 well plate. And the next day they were treated with kinases and DMSO as a control. And then 24 hours after, just so we can measure the direct effects of the inhibitors, the substrate was added and then fluorescence was measured afterwards. And then when discerning a significant su suppression, the relative activity compared to the control was calculated any and was calculated, sorry, and anything under uh, anything with a twofold decrease was considered a hit. And then just to quickly acknowledge that the Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto was the ones who conducted this screening for us. So these are my raw luciferase data results. So it is, so the, this is the mean, mean luciferase activity between two plates. Each sample had about two replicates. And then to get the relative activity, we uh, we divided one of the uh, one of the luciferase activity of the samples by the control. So here is the mean relative activity of all the samples. And I know that looking at a bunch of numbers is probably overwhelming or difficult to look at. So there's something a little bit more digestible. So here under here's a scatter plot of our of our results. And anything under this line right here of 0 0.5 was considered a hit. So from here, 19 hits were identified. And as of now, from these 19 hits, there are 16 novel and three known, which validates that our screening did work and was successful. And so since the purpose of this project was to focus on breast cancer, we decided to focus on protein kinases that are related to breast cancer, which cut down our list a little bit. So here were the eight that I continued with testing. So the three down here that are highlighted just shows that um, these are the three that were previously known. And once again, that our screening was successful. So then to further validate that these hits were real, we did a, I did a Western blot analysis. Or sorry, I did a luciferase assay first. To, and then, so here were my results of my luciferase assay. So it was once again compared to a DMSO control. So anything under the 1.0 line here was, can, was, uh, was uh, we measured anything under that 1.0 line. So as we can see here, these four had the most significant decreases. And these are the four that I will then focus on to make sure to further validate that they are real and not and that, that this suppression is real. And that brings us to our next sub aim, which is the validation of primary hits by Western blot analysis. So here were my results for the Western blot. As we can see here, uh, FAC, which is the new inhibitor that we see, or uh, the new uh, kinase inhibitor that we're using, has a very dramatic decrease compared to the other three here in both an anti pdl one and anti nano luck antibody. So therefore we decided to continue with FAC as our protein kinase of interest. And just some, a really brief introduction on FAC. So the focal adhesion kinase, also known as FAC as I've been calling it, is an intracellular non-receptor ty tyrosine kinase. It has previously been shown to mediate interactions with many proteins, but also associated with many cellular functions, such as cellular motility, adhesion, survival, lymphovascular invasion, epithelial mesenchymal transition, and migration. And then FAC has also been found to be highly regulated in triple negative breast cancer, therefore becoming our target. So this, now we then move on to AIM-2, so which was characterizing FAC as a novel regulator of pd one stability in triple negative breast cancer cells, MDA, MB231, and BT549. The reason that we chose these two cell lines was because they had the highest basal levels of both pd one and FAC. So this, um, this AIM had two sub-AIMs. The first one was the validation of FAC as a novel regulator of pdl one regulation in, t in triple negative breast cancer cells, and then also the interaction of FAC with pdl one in vivo. So first, I'll just be going over 2.1. So for this sub-aim, we wanted to validate the endogenous, exp uh, the endogenous expression of FAC and pdl one and FAC and pdl one relationship. So I, I did a Western blot analysis using the MDA MB231 cells to verify FAC expression. And as seen here, when the FAC inhibitor is present, there is minimal PDL, min, uh, there's no PDL1 expression compared to when it's only with the control. So this led us to believe that FAC uh, regulates PDL1. But just to make sure that since kinases have the possibility of having and kinase inhibitors have a possibility of having off-target effects, which could have influenced PDL1 expression, we want to see if FAC itself was the reason why 
um, PDL1 expression decreased. So to do this, we did a genetic back knockout in both NPA and B231 and BT549 cells. So I'm just going to quickly go over my protocol. So first I seeded both cell lines into a six well plate. And then I infected the cells with a virus that expressed three different gui uh, fat guide RNAs to knock out fat function. And then afterwards, the protein was extracted. And then finally, samples were visualized using the Western using a Western blot analysis. So here were the results for that. So when there when there was no fat knockout here, we can see that fat expression is present along with PDL1 along with PDL1 expression. While on the other hand, when there was a FAC knockout, as we can see here, there was no FAC expression, and then PDL1 expression decreased. And we also see that with the BT549 cells as well. So this, so now we know that FAC does regulate PDL1 stability. So now we want to know if FAC and PDL1 interact with one another. So this moves on to our ne my next sub aim, which is the interaction of FAC with PDL1 in vivo. And to do this, I did a coamino precipitation assay. So I really quickly wanted to go through what a co-IP assay is or co-amino precipitation assay is. And it's to look at the interactions using a Western blot, uh, protein interactions using a Western blot analysis. So to start off, FAC and PDL1 were both transfected either alone or together in a HEC293A cell line to, in to make sure it's overexpressing. And then afterwards, anti-flag or an anti-MIC, which were the tags on both proteins, were added into the cell lysate along with magnetic beads to pull down the proteins in to pull down the proteins. Afterwards, I washed the cell, I washed the lysates to make sure that the, the only proteins of interest in the protein complex of interest were left. And then finally, the proteins were eluded, so they were no longer bound to the beads, and then they were visualized using a Western blot analysis. So as we can see here, when both plasmids are present after pulling down PDL1, we can see interact, we can see that FAC and PDL1 do interact. And then when one or when only one of each plasmid is there, there's either no interaction or very minimal. And then this was also seen vice versa when we were pulling down FAC instead of PDL1. When both uh, when both plasmids were present, we can see that there is interaction between uh, PDL1 and FAK. So now that we know that PDL1 and FAC interact in cells that are overexpressing both proteins, we want to make sure that this that th this was similar in endog in an endogenous setting. So we want to verify endogenous the endogenous interaction of PDL1 and FAC in MDA MB231 cells. So as seen here, we use IG I use IgG as my negative control, and when I was pulling and when we were pulling down FAC, we can see that PDL1. Here we go we can see that there was an interaction between PDL1 and FAC when we immunoblotted against PDL1. And then doing the and vice versa, once again, when we were pulling down PDL1, we see that there was an interaction between FAC and PDL1 again endogenously. So now we know for sure that PDL1 and FAC do interact with one another. And so this was all for my results as of right now. So I'm just going to go into my future directions of my work. So first, um, I will be completing AIM 2.1, which is the validation of FAC as a novel regulator of PDL1 levels in, in triple negative breast cancer cells. And I'll be doing this by looking at the effects of different FAC inhibitors on PDL1 stability. And I'll be analyzing this um, by using a fluorescence activated cell storing analysis by measuring the membrane or uh, the PDL1 levels on the cell membrane. Next, I will then see the interaction of FAC and PDL1 in immune evasion. And I will be conducting a T cell killing assay with JERCAT T cells for an in vitro analysis. And then finally, and then also I will be doing a mouse model to validate FAC and PDL1 relationship using 4T1 valve C model. And then as for more future directions to investigate the correlation of FAC and PDL1 in a clinical breast cancer patient. So now I'll just be going quickly over a summary and significance. So just to summarize what I've had my so far with my findings, so we have successfully conducted a systematic screening of protein kinases involved in the regulation of PDL1. We have ident identified that there are 16 novel protein kinase regulators of, that of PDL1 stability and activity. We determined that there was a relationship between FAC expression and PDL1 expression. And then finally, that there was an interact interaction between FAC and PDL1. But what does this all mean? 
So these findings give rise to potential targeted therapies in triple negative breast cancers, but, but also opportunities to allow more for allow more for efficacious anti pdl one therapies in combination with VAC inhibitors. And then just really quickly, I would just like to thank Dr. Yang for his support and guidance throughout this year so far. Also to my committee members, Dr. Craig and Dr. Goudreau, as along with the program coordinator, Dr. Greer, for their advice and guidance throughout my first year of my master's. And then thank you to our collaborators for carrying out the screening and also the uh, rest of the Yang lab members for their advice and daily support. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm sure Asia, take, take a deep breath for a second. <laughs> Questions for Asia? Uh, is there a biological significance to kinase inhibitors that increase the stability of patching uh, your uh, Yeah, the increased back or increased PDL1. Uh, no, no. Oh, oh, sorry. The very, very first uh, analysis of phase uh, that you could read. Oh, okay. There were many uh, inhibitors that seem to increase the same. Oh, yes, yeah. Oh, and then sorry for just, I'm just going to repeat that really quickly for Zoom. So he asked to see if there was a biological significance between the kinases that increased the signal. So sorry, I'm just going to go back to that slide really quickly. This one, right? Or the one before that. Picture. This one? Okay. Yeah. So there were, we actually did have some that increased PDL1 expression that was right here. So this was the list that increased PDL1 expression. And this is actually another future direction that I'm hoping to go into is to see how if we can increase PDL1 expression along with the combination of an anti of one of these and anti PDL1 to see if that'll have a more um, efficacious or a better result compared, to, for example, in cancers that don't necessarily have a strong uh, PDL1 expression, if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, Gabby, for continuing on. And then just to quickly repeat that, so Gabby asked if there was a relationship between germline B. Yes, BR, yes. Uh, BRCA1 and PDL1 or and PDL1 expression in triple negative breast cancer. That's a very good question because as in one of the previous seminars, uh, someone talked about how there was multiple triple negative um, subtypes. So that's that is a very good question. I'm from what I know for about PDL1 expression in triple negative breast cancer, it didn't, I didn't, at least from my readings, I didn't find that there was a difference between germline, but I, I will definitely look more into that because that's a very, because the BRCA1 and 2 is very, uh, a very prominent mutation. So that's a very good idea to look into. Monty, go ahead. Uh, related to the combined spectrum components, I believe it's what was the readout of the output? Was that the repression or stability? Um, protein, protein stability, so expression pretty much. So if it increased, so what increased the expression and decrease after 24 hours of a protein? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Using the using the fusion protein that uh, Dr. Prem Kanal made. So uh, we were able to measure protein stability from uh, luciferase activity by using that um, fusion protein. We have not complemented that. No. Yeah. We've only done the screening so far. Um, I'll go for David first. In your introduction, you said that there was also a glycosylation involved. Do you know whether there are other PPMs that, that regulate the stability of PDL1? Yeah, so, um, so glycosylation is a major one by JAK1, but also uh, through JSK3. No, sorry, just JAK1 is a major one here. I can I'll pull up the image again. But then there's also ones for ubiquitination. So, for example, um, AMP. AMPK isn't ubiquitination specifically, but it does help with the degradation of PDL1 as it's uh, when it, when AMPK is activated and phosphorylates, it interacts with PDL1 to where it causes a degradation. Along with GSK3 beta, after an addition of beta TRCP, 
it then leads to degradation first, uh, through the endoplasmic reticulum associated protein degradation pathway. So there's up, so there are more um, post-translational modifications, but the, so far these are the ones that we've seen. But yeah, there's there's some in ubiquitination that helps um, degrade the protein more, which is probably what which is what we want to look for. But also there's acetylation that happens that helps translocate the protein to the nucleus as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great presentation. Yeah. Thank you. And, um, I, just, I just have like a question. If you go to the slide 23. This way. So I looked at what you dreamed about. So the background is a GSK data seems really efficient. But if you go right to the slide 26, which is a question law, somehow you end up with a back inhibitor, which is way more efficient. Yeah. GS3K Do you have like explanation? <laughs> Um, why that's the case, why there's so much oh, yes. difference. <laughs> yeah, so sorry. The question was, so in the luciferase assay, GSK3 beta showed to have a very significant decrease. But when looking at the Western blot, we see that FAC had a, a lot more significant decrease than GSK3 beta. So Dr. Goudreau is just asking why that could be. So this was actually a common uh, occurrence that happened. So we have, so just some previous results that we have from... If I can pull them up here. So here was a previous luciferase assay that was done. And as we can see here, EPHB4 also had very low, um, a low luciferase activity. But then after doing a Western blot, we see that that was not real. It had actually very high PDL1. So I'm not, so this, that's, it could be, yeah, like, mm -hmm. That's, so that's why we wanted to validate it, just to make sure that our hits were actually real and weren't like, and weren't fake like this. So I have a quick question. When you when you do knockouts of FAC, so you have a FAC knockout of two, three, one cells, what do they look like? For the fact that that yeah, what do the cells look like morphologically? So for that part, for the knockout, unfortunately, I Prem was oh. the one who carried out that experiment. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't there to see the cells. So what? But you still have. Them. We don't have no. We don't have those fact knockout cells okay. now. But we will have to do some more work for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Still have a minute or so. <laughs> I have a few others. So um, you haven't had a chance. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think Dr. Lily Crab had a question. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I, I, oh, Danny, go ahead. Um, I think um, in your slide, you showed that the pharmacologic inhibitors seem to work better than topics in terms of the use of the Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious if you have any idea if there could be some other kind of off target effect about the pharmacologic inhibitor. Um, sure. Sorry for this one. Yeah. 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 Well, this is... Yes, yeah. Is when you just oh, okay, I see. <laughs> there could be just because since protein kinases just have a vast amount of functions. So there definitely could be off target effects. But since we were able to verify with the knockout that it was fact that did do most of it. So at least we have that verification that without fact, PDL1 expression does decrease. But yeah, like there could definitely be off target effects for kindness. And that's a very good thing that we could look into. And sorry, the question was to see if um, it with the inhibitors only, it seemed like it had less expression of PDL1 compared to when we just did the knockout of fact. Okay, so there are a few other questions, but I'll try and pick uh, proteasomal inhibitors. Have you tried seeing if, if, if you can get any effects with proteasomal inhibitors? We have not tried that yet, no. But your model is suggesting that the like glycosylation is protecting it from yes. a subsequent ubiquitation and mm -hmm. proteasomal degradation. Yeah. So I found in um some readings that I did that the glyc that when it's non glycos sorry, non glycosylated, it actually promoted ubiquitination more. So for example, um 
there, there was this paper that I read that was a PARP inhibitor on effects on PDL1, and it showed that the PARP inhibitor actually phosphorylated GSK3 beta, which caused an increase in PDL1 expression due to the blocking of S, the SPOP proteasome um, from degrading it. So the, it's def there's definitely an option, but there may be something that that might stop inhibit that, similar to what GSK the phosphorylation of GSK3 beta did. Okay. I think we ran out of time. The clock ran out. Oh, man. <laughs>